it's good to see everyone here as always. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20. I know this is a text that some of you have been asking when we're going to get to chapter 20, so hopefully uh, our curiosity will be satisfied by our study this evening. And if not, I guess we'll have a lot of good discussion. But I'll tell you what I think it means. Uh, we've been looking at a cyclical view of the book and over and over again, John has been telling us about what is going to happen. It started off with a picture of God's omnipotence and power, and then partial judgments as God would treat Rome the way he would treat any other nation, that he would warn them and get their attention, if he could, to try to get them to repent. And so we saw several scenes of partial judgment at the earlier parts of the book, but then we noted the point at which God said, no more. Uh, the time for judgment has come, and ever since then, we have been seeing these pictures of destruction and celebration at the fall of the uh, church's enemy. And so, we've seen that picture paraded before us all throughout the book, and in our last chapter, at the end of chapter 19, uh, we saw the beast was seized and the false prophet. Those are the two beasts from chapter 13 the emperor, uh, or the Roman Empire and the Re emperor cult, and uh, they are thrown into uh, the lake of fire. And so that judgment is going to happen, but John wants to tell us this story one more time, and that's going to take chapters 20, 21, and 22 to do it. It is kind of the big bang on which the book closes, and so what we're going to look at tonight is not just the fall of the empire, and the enemy of God's people, we've seen that described in many ways, but even more importantly, the fall of the power that made it such an enemy in the first place. Uh, in the background, and we won't spend too much on this, but just simply call it to notice, uh, John is kind of following a sequence that appears in the book of Ezekiel here. Uh, in Ezekiel 37, we have the vision of the Valley of the Dry Bones, where God's people are brought back to life, and then that is followed in chapters 38 and 39 about uh, the destruction of their archetypical enemy Gog and Magog. Uh, same kind of thing that we find here in Revelation 20. There is a scene of a resurrection, people coming to life, and then the judgment of enemies. Uh, before we get into the details, though, there are two things that we want to keep in mind. Uh, whatever we say about chapter 20, I think it has to be consistent with what we've said about the rest of the book. I don't think that it would be proper, given the approach that we have taken to the book thus far, to come to chapter 20 and throw everything out the window and say, well, this is about the future. And this is about, uh, you know, what happened in the Italian Renaissance or something like that. Uh, no, whatever this story means, it means what the rest of the book means. Uh, these alternating scenes of victory and judgment uh, should not surprise us at all by now. And, of course, we also want an interpretation that is consistent with the rest of Scripture. So we're going to try to take those two things and see if we can't come up with an understanding of Revelation 20. So starting in verse 1, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand doesn't take a lot of imagination to figure out what he is up to. He's going to lock somebody up. Uh, the abyss, we've seen that before, the abode of evil spirits. And so he has got the key. He's going to open it up to put somebody in there. And the chain in his hand is obviously to bind somebody uh, and imprison them in the abyss. And we don't have to read any further until we find out who it is. Verse 2, he laid hold of the dragon the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, threw him into the abyss, shut it and sealed it over him, so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. All right, when was Satan bound? Well, let's use the Bible to answer that question. Uh, Matthew 12, 29. Jesus is there kind of talking cryptically, as he often did, about his own ministry. And he had been accused of casting out demons by Satan. That you're in league with them, and so they listen to you. Uh, 
And Jesus says, no, the reason they listen to me is because I'm conquering them. And I'm the one that's come into the strong man's house to overtake him and bind him. Uh, John 12, 31. There's Jesus talking about his impending death uh, in John chapter 12. And he says, I want you guys to understand what's going to happen. I'm going to cast out the ruler of this world. I'm going to defeat my enemy and dethrone him, as it were. In Hebrews 2.14, the children share in flesh and blood. Since they do that, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. How did Jesus render Satan powerless? By dying for our sins and his resurrection from the grave. And Paul talks about this as he tells the Colossians what has happened to them in Colossians 2.15. He has despoiled the principalities and powers. He has robbed them of their goods and made a public display of them. That's that Roman triumphal imagery, parading his defeated enemies through the universe, as it were. And in Ephesians 4 and verse 8, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives that he took into captivity uh, all of his enemies, is what Paul is trying to say there. When did this happen? Well, it happened when Jesus died and was raised from the dead. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, as he talks about the results of the resurrection and how uh, being raised from the dead he is to die no more and he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. He began to reign when he was raised from the dead. He's now at the right hand of God continuing that reign. And so uh, this is what John is talking about. Now, we all realize this is not an absolute restriction, that when Jesus was risen from the dead, it's not like Satan went away and never bothered anybody again. But the point of the Bible is that Satan couldn't do to us what he used to do to us, that all have sinned, but now there's a way out of sin. And even though we have to pay the penalty for our sin, and that is death, there's a way out of death now. And so Satan can't do to us what he used to be able to do to people. And with that, uh, Satan's power was given the decisive breaking blow. And so think about it in, in these terms, that we're going to start with the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus himself talked about his work as being a binding of a strong man or as John refers to it here, the binding of Satan. Uh, in verse 3, uh, they threw him, uh, the angel threw the dragon into the abyss so that he would not deceive the nations. By now you know who the nations are in the book of Revelation. That's John's way of talking about unbelievers. Not just different ethnicities, but nations is a way of saying unbelievers. And so he's not going to be able to deceive the world the way he used to. Why not? Well, because there's something in the world now that clears up the deception. Uh, before Jesus did his work, Satan's work, of course, had affected many nations. We read about uh, Romans chapter 1, Paul says, look what it's done to the people of our day. And of course, the Roman Empire covered many nations. But with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and his going back to the Father uh, sitting at his right hand, the gospel began to be preached. And that message cleared up all the deception, didn't it? That message was the truth that people had been wanting to hear. And so... There would be a time, John says, when Satan's work would be curtailed so that he wouldn't be able to deceive the nations like he used to, and this would go on for a period that John calls a thousand years. Uh, we'll come back to that thousand years in just a moment, but for now the point is that the time of deception ended when the gospel began to be preached. And so we have the death and resurrection of Jesus, and after that, a time in which the gospel is spread. Now, while all that is going on, John says another thing is going on. Look in verse 4. I saw thrones, 
and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. Well, that's not something that we've seen too much in the book before, but if we will just simply follow the language throughout the Bible, Jesus also talked about this very thing. In Matthew 19, 28, remember the disciples had said, Lord, we've given up everything. What are we going to get for following you? And Jesus said that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, the regeneration, that's not the end of the world. That's when Jesus takes his seat at the Father's right hand after his resurrection. Sitting on his glorious throne is something that he does right now. So Jesus was not talking about the end of the world here. He was talking about what we call the messianic age. That after I'm gone, you men are going to be given great positions in the kingdom. And you will be enthroned, as it were. Now, that's not literal, right? The apostles didn't set up thrones in Jerusalem. Uh, but Jesus says, you're going to be, uh, you're going to have a high status in the kingdom, and these men would be judging. Well, same kind of thing going on here. Uh, there are thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. Uh, we're not told who sat on them. Uh, it could be the apostles here. It could be also all believers. There is a case to be made in the Bible that all of us will reign with Jesus Christ. Paul says that in one of his letters to Timothy. Uh, but be that as it may, we begin to understand what is being talked about here. Not only that, John says in verse 4, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. Now we saw these back in chapter 5. Or, or chapter 6, as it were, um, the, the souls under the altar crying out for vengeance. John sees them again, and it was those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead or on their hand. All that's from chapter 13. They have not given in to the enemy. And John says, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That language of coming to life is not only resurrection language, but in the Bible the resurrection is more than just coming back to life. Uh, the resurrection is victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? Paul says at the end of 1 Corinthians 15. When the resurrection happens, we will have been victorious over our final enemy. And that's what uh, the phrase means here as well, that not only did they come back to life in some sense, but they were victorious. That's the theme that we've been looking at in the book, isn't it? That these people who are faithful are the real winners in this contest. Even though they get killed, they still won because they didn't give in to the demands of the enemy. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5, a familiar passage, this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Uh, in 1 John chapter 2, uh, John makes a similar statement in verse, uh, verses 13 and following. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who's been from the beginning, because you've overcome the evil one, because you know the Father. Um, and verse 14, again, because you have overcome the evil one. Uh, chapter 4 and verse 4, you have overcome them because... Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Uh, and we've seen this language also in the book of Revelation, chapters 12 and chapters 15, this language about coming to life. 15.2, uh, 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 they were standing uh, at the sea of glass, victorious over the beast and over his image. There they are, very much alive, but it's not just the fact that they're alive that John wants us to see, that there's a sense in which their enemy didn't take their lives, that God has made them the victors in all of this. Now John says that they came to life, they were the victors, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. 
I don't know of any reason not to believe that that thousand years isn't the same one as the one in verses 2 and 3. I don't know of anybody that suggests this is a separate thousand years at a different time. Uh, no, the picture is that Satan is going to be controlled. He's going to be, his power has been curtailed. And while that is going on, while he's being put down, the people of God are enjoying a victory. And John says in verse 5, the rest of the dead didn't come to life until the thousand years were completed. Those are the unbelievers. They don't reign in this. Uh, they're, they're, they're out of the picture for the moment. But John does say that this is the first resurrection. And what he means by that is that the ones in verse 4 who came to life, that's the first resurrection that John's talking about. John explicitly mentions a first resurrection. If there is a first, we would expect maybe a second. But the opposite of first can also be new. Uh, we see in chapter 21 and verse 2, uh, there is a new heaven because the first heaven had passed away. So whether we want to talk about a second resurrection or a new resurrection, uh, the point is the same, that there are two of these things, a first one and a second one. And we get this kind of picture elsewhere in the Bible. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse 16, let's start in verse 15. We are a fragrance of God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, to those who are perishing, we are an aroma from death to death. But to the others, those who are being saved, we are an aroma from from life to life. There is a sense, Paul says, in which we are going from life to life. And that's the same kind of thing that we find here in Revelation, that there is a first resurrection and there is a second one, that we go from one life and we go to another life. And there is a first death and there is a second death as well. John talks in verse 6 about those... Uh, who will be involved in the second death. We'll come back to that one later. Uh, for now, let's see if we can't figure out what this first resurrection is. And there are plenty of passages that clarify this for us. The clearest one, I think, uh, is in John chapter 5, written by the same person who wrote the book of Revelation as he recorded the teachings of Jesus. Listen to what Jesus said in John 5, starting in verse 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is. This is happening right now, Jesus said. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. What was Jesus talking about there? He's talking about the preaching of the gospel that my word is making dead people live, not physically, but spiritually. It is the word that gives them spiritual life again. He says in verse 28, Do not marvel at this, that I can do that. For an hour is coming, and notice he doesn't say coming and is now happening, but just is coming, in which those who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. There we've got two resurrections. The first one is the spiritual resurrection of man, when we go from being dead in our sins to alive in God by hearing the gospel. And then Jesus says the, the fullest expression of our new life will come, an hour is coming, when I will raise all the dead physically as well. And they'll not only have new spirits, but they'll have new bodies to go with them. Paul talks about this same kind of thing in the book of Romans. Uh, in Romans chapter 8, in that marvelous passage about the spirit, Paul says in verse 10, If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. So my body is going to die because of the sins that I've committed, 
but at least my spirit is alive now because of Christ Jesus. But Paul says it doesn't end there. Look at verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit. That if God has raised your spirit, he will also raise your body. That's exactly what Jesus was talking about in John chapter 5. Uh, You might want to look at Romans 6 and verse 13. Uh, Paul there says, do not go on presenting the members of your body as, uh, to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. Present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness over you. There's a sense in which I'm already alive from the dead right now. And that is that sin is not reigning over me. Uh, and there are several other passages, Ephesians 2. Uh, let's look, for example, at Colossians 2, just quickly. Colossians 2.12, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him. The Bible uses this resurrection language of what has happened to us in Christ Jesus. Uh, John 11. 24. Again, this is the same person who wrote the the book of Revelation as he is recording uh, what Jesus said to Martha at the tomb of Lazarus. Your brother will rise again. She says, I know that he will rise in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. The language is different, but it's the same idea that you will live now and you will never die, you will live again eternally. So, what is this first resurrection? Well, the first resurrection is the raising of the spiritually dead through the gospel, and that corresponds with this preaching of the gospel. So, after the death and resurrection of Jesus, Jesus had dealt Satan a crushing blow, His power was from then on crippled. The gospel then began to be preached, and it is during this time that people became alive again, spiritually speaking. They lived and reigned as a result of hearing the gospel. The rest of the dead, verse 5, the wicked, that is, they did not come to life because they don't listen to the gospel. That's why they don't come to life. They don't share in the victory that belongs only to believers. Instead, they share in the defeat that Satan is experiencing here. Uh, They do not come to life until the thousand years were completed. And so, again, it's that same thousand year period, which we're going to look at here uh, right now. But John is talking about things that they would have known very well. Now, this thousand years, that's the thing that everybody wants to know about and asks about. And I guess I would just say, are any numbers in the book of Revelation literal that you know of? I haven't seen one yet. And this one isn't any exception. John is not talking about a literal 1,000-year period of history here. But this number is symbolic just like every other number in the book. And it is 10 times 10 times 10. There is a perfect amount of time that God has set aside here. What was the purpose of God setting aside this time for the preaching of the gospel? And so there was a time before the emperor cult rose up and started being the enemy of Christians when... The gospel was making progress. The kingdom of God was spreading all over the face of the earth. And during that time, it was a time that God had planned for the advance of his kingdom. So when is this thousand years? Well, it's this period between the death of Jesus and the time when Satan began using the emperor cult as an enemy of God's people. It wasn't a literal thousand years. It's probably more like 60 or 70 years at the most. So, you know, we're not talking about literal numbers here, but it was the time that God used to establish his kingdom 
among men. Uh, John says in verse 6, Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. If there is a second death, there must be a first death. What is the first death? Well, it's when we died because of our sins. It was our death spiritually. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, You were dead in your sins and trespasses, Paul says. 1 Timothy 5, 6, She who gives herself to want and pleasure is dead while she's alive. It's possible to be spiritually dead and your body still physically alive, the Bible teaches. That's the first death that we experience. The death of our spirits. That the death of, of the inner man uh, because of sin. Now, Paul, uh, John's going to come back to this second death in verse 14, so we're going to put that on hold. But John is saying that if you've been born again, if you have part in the first resurrection, you've come to life spiritually, then this second death isn't going to be a problem for you. We're going to find out what that second death is. Um, rather, these people be, become priests of God and reign with him for this thousand-year period. Then, verse 7, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. And he will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they come up on the broad plain of the earth and surround the camp of the saints and the beloved city and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. What is this deceiving the nations? You know, a lot of people say, well, that's, that's what's going on right now. Pick up a newspaper and you'll see that that's going on right now. He's not talking about our time. He's talking about theirs. And this deception of the nations is the very same thing that John has been talking about all throughout the rest of the book. That, remember the picture that we saw a couple chapters ago? That Rome is like a harlot that seduces all the nations of the earth with her harlotry and makes them drink the wine of her harlotry and gets them drunk with her materialism and, and all of those things. That's the same thing here. It's not a different activity. It's the same thing John has been talking about all throughout the book. Uh, the rise of this great enemy of God under Satan's instigation using the Roman Empire and the Roman Emperor called as his tool to wage war against the saints. And in doing so, he has recruited all the nations of the Roman Empire, got them on board, deceived them into thinking that the Roman Emperor is some kind of a god, worshiping him and persecuting those who won't. That's the picture John is painting here. And so there's really nothing mysterious, I suggest, about what's going on here. If you've read the first 19 chapters of the book, we should be able to come to this part and say, well, of course that's what happens. That's what I've been seeing over and over and over again. So when did the thousand years end? It ended when the conflict between the emperor cult and the church arose. Now, can you put your finger on a date on the calendar when that started? No. But it was a definite time in history. What I'm suggesting tonight is that this is what John is saying, that that thousand years ended, Satan is released to wage war against the church, and that corresponds to the very thing that we've been looking at through the rest of the book, the rise of this great enemy, Satan gathering the Roman Empire under his wing uh, for it to become his uh, agent against the church. Uh, he comes out to deceive the nations. We've already suggested what that is in the book. And Gog and Magog, verse 8, uh, are included in this. Uh, they, it's almost as if they are kind of the, the summary of all of this. And we don't have time this evening to go through Ezekiel 38 and 39. Those are very difficult chapters uh, anyway. Uh, but the picture there in the book of Ezekiel is of 
God's people being attacked by a great and fierce enemy and God protecting them and defeating their enemy for them. And John is simply saying to us, it's kind of like what you saw back in the book of Ezekiel, that same image, that same picture, that God is going to destroy this coalition of hostile nations that have united together against his people. Uh, and in typical fashion, uh, verse 8 and verse 9, they gather together, and we expect to hear about some big war, but it really never is described. Uh, we've seen this before. Uh, the war reminds us of chapter 16. Uh, chapter 17, the harlot deceiving the nations, getting everybody uh, together. Uh, this idea of waging war uh, common theme throughout the book that there is going to be a big showdown in which God is going to defeat this enemy and so the messianic age is a time of victory they are reigning uh, they are alive again in Christ Jesus but it's also a time of warfare for the saints on earth and so my suggestion uh, is that what John is talking about in verses 7, 8, and 9 is the same thing that the book has been talking about in the first 19 chapters, this enemy that was facing the Christians at the end of the first century. Uh, and in typical fashion, in verse 9, uh, they're gathered together for the big war, and before you can even blink your eye, it's over. It's not as if there's even a struggle. God wipes them out. There's really no war to describe because they're gone in a heartbeat. And we've seen that picture over and over again in the book as well. Chapters 14, 16, 18, 19. And so it shouldn't surprise us that we see it here again. It says, uh, fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And so the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. That's from the end of chapter 19. And they will be tormented day and night forever. So, what the picture appears to be is something like this. That the death and resurrection of Jesus inaugurated the time when evil could not do what it used to do. It was a time of victory for the people of God. The gospel was being spread. People were coming to life spiritually because of the preaching of the gospel. But God, in his wisdom, said, I'm not just going to let this just go on forever. My people need to be tested. And he allowed them to be tested in one of the most fiercest contests uh, against the church that we know about. And that is he allowed Satan to do his worst with the Roman Empire to persecute his people, uh, and the book of Revelation is about that. Be faithful through this. Don't give in, and you will too join those who reign. Uh, John is saying, I want you to know how it ends, that there is basically no prolonged battle. God wipes them out, and your enemy, verse 10, the devil, is thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. Rome is not going to be your enemy forever. God is going to devour them and do away with the power that had caused this. All right, uh, as we finish up here, verses 11 through 15, I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence the heaven and earth fled away, no place was found for them. Uh, this strongly... This whole passage looks like the judgment at the end of time. Um, John says, I saw him who sat upon it. And there's a lot of references to that in the New Testament. Acts 17.31, God has appointed the man through whom he will judge the world. 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all made, be made to stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Uh, Romans 14 and in verse 10, uh, Paul says, uh, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. And so there's a lot of this kind of language in the Bible about everybody standing before uh, the Lord. Uh, and this idea of uh, 
heaven and earth fleeing away, no place found for them. Uh, we've seen this kind of thing uh, earlier in the book, chapter 6, chapter 16 and verse 20, for example. Uh, Every island fled, the mountains were not found. Uh, it's a picture, basically, of judgment that focuses on the unbelievers. Uh, this is not the picture of Matthew 25, where Jesus says, this is what I'm going to say to the good, and this is what I'm going to say to the evil. The focus in Revelation 20, 11 through 15, is what God's going to do to the un unbelievers. The people who were the enemy of Christians on the earth. And God says, well, I'm going to take care of them too. Not only have I destroyed by this time Satan and shut him up and he'll never destroy anything again, I'm going to take care of the people who were your enemies on the earth. And so this is designed to comfort these people, knowing that they would be vindicated uh, in the end. Uh, we have here in verse 12 a reference to books being opened, the book of life, and everybody being judged out of it. Verse 13, the sea gives up the dead, Hades gives up the dead, everybody is judged no matter where they are, uh, they are gathered for this judgment. Verse 14, then death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that there won't be any more dying after that, that death will have been completely conquered, so death itself is destroyed, and if anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Again, Paul mentions that kind of thing in Philippians 4. So this certainly does look like the, the judgment at the end of the world. And so the final picture looks something like this, that God is saying, let me tell you how it's all going to end. I'm going to defeat Rome. I'm going to tear down the emperor cult. Then I'm going to deal with Satan, and I'm going to deal with the people who bothered you on this earth at the last day. And then the only thing left to describe is verse uh, chapters 21 and 22, the glories of heaven for the faithful. So, this chapter retells the entire story, but it's their life that John is talking about, not ours. Just like everything else in the book. It's about what they were going to go through and what they had to look forward to. It's not about our day and our time and what we read about in the newspapers now. And this telling of the story spans from the life of Christ to the end of the world, and it is depicted as one big string of victories after another, in which Satan and all of his helpers are finally defeated, and in the end, God's people are free, and they're alive, and they're victorious. Uh, any questions or observations down through the end of chapter 20? I know we've covered a lot. That's a lot to think about. Well, you might want to think about it for a little bit. If you have a question about it, we can certainly spend some class time next time or maybe the time after that talking about it. But I uh, appreciate your good attention as always.